So, guys, uh, I have been asked to try to ask you difficult and controversial questions. It's a really bad job for me because I'm going to end up losing five clients in a very like culturally sensitive area of the world. So we'll see how we go with that. But maybe to indulge everybody, we could go around the table and you can give a reasonably proper, long, salesy introduction to yourselves, starting over here. All right. I'm, uh, I'm Matthias, and I'm the founder and uh, the CEO of Imagine TV. And we work with uh, internet distributed TV. And uh, we've been at this for two, five years. And uh, my history before that was creating a Swedish company called Bodler, which was in some slides here before, and before that in computer gaming. So I'm what you call a serial entrepreneur. Uh, and uh, when it comes to Imagine, um, it's an interesting story because uh, we have uh, been able to grow quite fast, more so outside of Sweden than in Sweden. So um, uh, in Germany, for instance, we're already considered a, a big player when it comes to, to distributed of TV. And we are the first uh, internet uh, distributor of TV that has all channels in any country in the world and also with the support of all major studios. Uh, so we're quite happy about that, and it's growing by thousands and thousands of users every day. And soon we're into a couple of more countries. So, uh, and it started because TV is the biggest distribution form in the world of, of anything that has to do with media. Uh, we usually do slides where you see that cable and satellite subscriptions stands for two-thirds of all media spending in Europe. And uh, the rest is movies, music, uh, DVDs, what have you, games even. Uh, so it's, it's a massive industry, and um, uh, it's an extremely interesting industry to work in because the value chain wasn't broken. Uh, so in music, for instance, the value chain was totally broken. In TV, it's not. People watch more TV than ever. Uh, but distribution is old. Distribution is dated and uh, by distributing uh, over internet with all the functions that it gives you. All devices, you don't have to mind time and you can watch whatever content you want at the time you want. Together with the data of telling you to do better things, it's a fantastic thing. We actually have, have more viewing time per user than average on TV, for instance, in general mm. in the country we're in. So we have really, really high activation data and, and, uh, on, on users. and. Um, it's fun to go at the biggest media industry. Great. I think that's a great intro. And I tell you, every time I speak to Bauer or Bird or Proceed, and they're like, oh, Per, we, we really need to get a day to come up to Stockholm, dot, 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 so we can meet Margin. <laughs> you made an impression. Jonathan. I'll lower the bar for you now. Is this, is this on? Yeah. You hear me OK? Um, my name is Jonathan Forster. I, I um, came to Sweden about eight years ago, uh, slightly tired of working with crazy American and British entrepreneurs, and met a really harmless-looking chap called Daniel Ek. <laughs> so that went well. Um, I joined Spotify as one of its first employees, and now obviously we've had a, a very well-publicized and really fun uh, journey working with something that is... Um, it's so intrinsic to everybody's life. I mean, wherever you are in the world, whoever you are as a person, whatever you like to do, music is um, excruciatingly important to us. Yet as a business, as you say, um, it has had a tendency to get itself in something of a mess. Um, whether it's the fact that you have localized rights so that each market needs to be dealt with differently, um, the fact that you have recording contracts versus, versus publishing rights, it's a very challenging space for, for companies historically to enter. And then you have the technological aspect. Um, when we launched Spotify in 2008, um, maybe not the case for some of the people in this room, but if, if you're a normal human being in Sweden, you couldn't get an iPhone. The iPad didn't exist. Um, obviously, the pace of technology is, is staggering. That works. Yeah, I'll just repeat we everything. Well, those at the front who are following me. Um, so we, 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 we've, had a, we've had a wonderful um, time with Spotify where we're delighted um, to be able to announce uh, the other week that we've hit 40 million users, uh, 10 million paying. Um, 
paying the music industry over a billion dollars has definitely um, warmed uh, them in their dealings with us. But I think it's important to say that we're even more excited about the future ahead of us, not just globally as we enter markets like Brazil or, or you know, device factors like the car, um, but even in Sweden where pretty much every kid has Spotify, but maybe only one of their parents does. I see huge opportunities for growth. Um, so yeah, that's what I do, and I, I really enjoy it. Fantastic. So uh, my name is Henrik, uh, and uh, I am CEO and one of the co-founders of Toby Technology. Uh, in Toby, we are the global leaders in a technology space called eye tracking. And eye tracking essentially means that a computer can tell where a user is looking. So if you're sitting in front of a device of any kind, we know where on a screen or where relative to the device you as a user are looking. Um, that is fundamentally a an enabling technology, a fundamental sensor technology. Um, and uh, we have been working for a number of years now to build up a company and a business in a number of different verticals where we apply this technology. And I think that taking a technology to market uh, with such a deep-rooted technology approach as we have is actually quite different from taking a product to market or an app to market. Um, and it poses very specific challenges and also very specific opportunities. And I think that eye tracking is, obviously I'm somewhat biased, but I think it's extremely exciting because there are so many applications, so many usages, so many markets, so many types of devices that this technology applies to. Uh, that probably one of our biggest challenges is to understand what products, what markets, what, what applications to go after. Um, and that's been a very exciting journey in creating and building a company over a number of years around a technology like this. We're now, uh, did a fairly, for us, a fairly sizable acquisition just two weeks ago. So we're now up to $125 million in revenue as a company. One of the key challenges and exciting things that we're working on right now and key focus for us is to bring this technology into the consumer mass market space, to integrate eye tracking into everyday computers, everyday tablets, everyday cars. And that's a very exciting technology evolution that I'm absolutely certain that we will see over the next couple of years. Great, Henry. fantastic. Hey everyone, so I'm um, Eric. I work for a company called Klarna. Um, I'm part of the management team and I've been that since um, January this year. I'm responsible for the consumer side, so making sure that um, the consumer is at the forefront of everything we develop. Klarna is a company that is trying to solve payments, not only online, but throughout the universe. Um, we uh, have 45,000 merchants, 25 million users across 14 European countries. Um, and we were founded eight years ago. Um, I would say that the problem with payments companies in general um, is that they're trying to solve problems that do not exist. Um, if you look at most mobile payment companies out there today, they're trying to solve for a problem that is, how do I pay with a credit card in a store? And it, it works pretty well, actually. What Klarna tried to solve when it was founded eight years ago was, how do I pay online? It's a process that normally involves like 30 different steps. Um, you have to remember so many different passwords. You have to remember login details. You have to remember uh, what was my mother's maiden name. And even if you go through the whole entire process after you've put in like 16 digits, you need to go through a Visa 3D secure process. And that whole entire process takes maybe 20, 30 minutes if you're lucky. With Klarna, it takes a few clicks. And um, that was what we were trying to solve, and I think we're finally getting there. It's been a lot of work, um, but um, yeah, we're now expanding to uh, four different countries in parallel, 
but we're looking especially at the UK and US as next markets. Great, super stuff, incredible journey. So, uh, hi everybody, my name is Daniel. Uh, I'm CEO and co-founder of Fund by Me. Uh, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be in this panel. I think I'm the least successful compared to you guys. I think, you know, uh, usually um, I'm getting quite used to get into panels where I'm, I'm, I'm sitting with my idols. Uh, you know, all of your companies are companies that I look forward to. But I think today I actually sit here to, to symbolize, you know, all these billions of people that we are forgetting, you know, the paradigm shift which is just about to happen. We are living in 2014. We have technology to, which is smarter. We have uh, social interaction which is changing our behavior. And I think I should speak as a symbol for all these people because I am, you know, in reality, I'm one of those uninvestable people. I'm a Romanian art major, which uh, if I would send you an email, you would probably not even reply. Uh, but uh, luckily enough, some of the people in this room, you want sitting there, uh, he said, well, this guy might have something, and he believed in me, and he uh, opened a ton of doors for me. So um, I'm here to represent the, the uh, new age of funding companies, which uh, um, you can call crowdfunding or crowdsourcing or equity crowdfunding or whatever, but I think in reality it's a new movement where a lot of people realize that not only they want to be part of stuff, but they soon will demand to be part of stuff. So, um, once again, I am an art major f born in Romania. So in 2010, I had this idea which I needed funding for. And I knocked on every door and everybody said, wake up. Uh, I found Kickstarter in America. I approached Kickstarter. They said, you can't be here because you're non-American. Um, I got sad. I got mad. I got creative. And I said, well, let's open a European crowdfunding platform. And quite soon we realized that Sweden was too small uh, and we are different from the Americans. So we had to do something else. So in 2012, we launched equity crowdfunding, which is funding of companies through the masses. You can get 5, 10, 200 or 500 new owners in your company. And we went in, uh, from two people in September 2012 to 19 people in eight countries currently. And... Uh, um, we're still far away from where we want to be, but I think we are just at the brink of a new kind of uh, movement, which I think you all guys and girls are aware of. Um, and if I may brag a bit, um, a lot of people said, does this really work in Sweden? Is this actually good? Are your networks actually valid? Uh, so in March of this year, we said, let's prove it. So we wanted to raise three million crowns for survival uh, in 45 days. And we raised three million in 32 hours. And currently we are just about to sign a total of seven to 10 million crowns, which proves that it does work. You can fund companies quite well, quite fast from a lot of people. So thank you once again for inviting me. I'm impressed about your uh, you know, present stage. I'm a, a bit scared about your uh, you know, scrutinizing questions. <laughs> but you know, uh, take the floor and, and just ask us. I think, I, um, I think you'll fare well, but uh, these were great introductions, and I mean, it's, you're all fantastic businesses, and I don't generally say that. But we're going to test the audience now. I mean, we need to wake you guys up. So, on each of these companies, starting to the left, how many of you have actually used the service? Imagine. Raise a hand. Okay, so that's it. 20, 25%. It's pretty good penetration for a third-rate country. And how many of you have paid for the service? Okay, one. So you're still, okay, four. You're still largely a consumer of capital. Spotify, how many have used Spotify? Okay, good success. Good success. How many of you are paying subscribers? Belong to the 10 million club. Ah, very good, very good. Sweden is obviously in the forefront of streaming music. <laughs> now, uh, how many of you are handicapped and use eye tracking in your day-to-day -day life? So I'm going to give... I tried, I tried, Toby, though. 
<laughs> I, I will give Henrik much fairer questions later on, but I can say in the very near future you will be able to buy both cars and pieces and a lot of non-handicapped stuff, and you can get into gear as a believer. Now, despite some press misgivings, how many of you have made a payment with Klarna? Fantastic. That's good, over half percent. And, and how many of you use Klarna to make uh, a funded by me investment? We're not. No. <laughs> okay, yeah. so We're we not can sit down yet. at the negotiation table later on. How many of you have made any kind of crowdfunding investment of any sort on Kickstarter, funded by me, and so forth? So you're obviously on to an interesting trend here. But, I mean, there's so many good questions to ask, but one of the things that, that I find really interesting is this uh, new uh, document that Mark Benioff has released with his kind of, I think it's 155 business rules. Uh, I was lucky to meet him in 98 and stupid enough to go to banking instead of working for him and seen the success since. And he's a very smart sales guy. And his number 15 uh, rule, I think, is particularly good. It's about positioning. So I would say with, with Spotify, I mean, you've had to position initially, I would say, against Napster, I mean, against Pirate Bay, against iTunes, against Pandora. And imagine, I mean, you clearly will always have to position yourself against YouTube, and then we have BBC iPlayer and a whole plethora of things. Uh, Netflix, HBO, and, and, and Klarna, I mean, the elephant in the room is always PayPal. I mean, we try to talk about Klarna positively, and then somebody asks a PayPal question, it all gets a bit scary. And, and funded by me, Kickstarter, it's not the same thing, but it's, it's the gorilla and then the stock market. <laughs> so, and, and again, I'll come back to Toby because it's a very different type of business, but so some people call that kind of red ocean strategies. You're not inventing, you're going into something where there is a, various players that are incumbent, that are strong. But it, it has totally worked for you. I mean, what are the, maybe starting with Jonathan, what are the kind of two or three takeaways? I mean, how could you break that game? I'm, I'm not now talking about breaking the, the publisher and, and content owner value chain. I'm breaking the other new wave companies. I, I think we have. Can you hear me now? Both working. No, both, it's both. okay. Yeah. It should work. You hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we had to do that for the content providers in order to get the licenses. So we had to convince them as consumers before anything else. Um, and it's really tricky because we didn't see anybody doing what we were trying to do. Daniel didn't, Martin didn't, myself. But you need to give people a point of reference. So you have that moment of, you see the visible relief in their face when, when they say, oh, you're like this but that. Um, and whether that's Pandora or in the US when we went on our first meetings, Rhapsody, yeah. which was a subscription legal service Proper. that had been around this for quite a while. Um, but I can say that within Spotify, we've, we've only ever focused on, on piracy. Um, Daniel and the leadership team's view has consistently been that in piracy, we have something which unlocks a lot of the magic of music, and it plays by zero rules. So it's like a zombie that you can't kill, zero cost base, they can do anything they want. And if, if we can create products that, um, that users react well to compared to piracy, then, then we can feel confident that you know, another company with um, a really sharp developer or huge resources will, will find us a tough uh, proposition to battle against. So you really made piracy your positioning ha against. It has to be better than piracy. Why would yeah. you pay for something that you can get for free? And I, I think we managed it. I mean, Spotify is, was and still is quicker than playing the song from your hard drive. And, and, and you know, tiny uh, differences like that are, are what you're forced to focus on if you, um, you, know, if you pick a, a really hard competitor like that mm. that isn't playing by the rules. So it was, in a way, it was the choice of your positioning made a difference. You didn't lift your competitors. You lifted a problem and made that. 
I, I don't They're think competitor. That, I don't think that consumers were that bothered about it being a problem. Even Swedes, who no. for the most part are a very law-abiding, ethical, nice bunch of folks, I don't think it was eating them up inside that they were breaking the law and stealing music. They just had a nagging feeling that they could do better. I mean, after the 20th time that damn diesel thing around the CD broke, you stopped caring, right? I mean, the abuse from the music industry was just so harsh that he made even Swedes <laughs> criminals. I think the love of music. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, I think the, um, it didn't feel like stealing. You no. know, it was, it was the, the, the um, music industry advertising campaign in the US, you wouldn't steal a car, why would you steal music? And kids just, you know, they mocked that. It would have been a meme if we had have had memes then. I know if I speak to a 15 year old now in Sweden about, you know, I go to a student party or whatever and I ask them about, stealing music, they look at me like I'm crackers. Yeah. You know, they just don't get that they would ever need to do that. And it's not to say that it couldn't come back. Um, well, well, let's move that on to Magin. So, I mean, people try to draw similarities, but I mean, from my perspective, actually two fundamentally different value chains where I think you're playing in a much, much tougher swimming pool. I mean, Stupid, but not so stupid. I mean, not spent the last 30 years, you know, smoking drugs, trying to remember that Janis Joplin concert and <laughs> making that a bona fide reason to be a record label. I mean, you're up against Chipstead, TV4. I mean, these are all evil businesses, but they're smart evil businesses. Well, some of them are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how would you rank? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what did you do? I mean, to begin with, it's, um, it's timing, to be honest. Uh, today, if you look at anyone in this room, they have devices with them that are screens that you could view TV on. Yeah. But the industry haven't moved there. And uh, a consumer don't really care about screens. If you ask a, a consumer, he doesn't care about it's a screen on the wall or a screen in his pocket or a screen uh, in the bus. They want to watch content. And uh, the industry, as you said, it's, it's, it's a bit smarter uh, in that way because they kind of understand that the world is heading that way. They also see downwards trends. So you see a younger population who ever, never ever even get a TV subscription. You see other parts that is actually removing themselves from TV subscription. They call cord cutters, basically cut the cord. And in this space, you also have um, companies which no one loves. Who in here loves their TV operator? Comham? Any lovers for Comham? Any long? Yeah. Stock ideas on that? Yeah. No? So, Zero. I mean, it, it's a lot. Right. Yes. You're, you're obviously right. Yeah. So it's or they're it, all asleep. Yes. <laughs> I hope I'm right. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, I'm really boring. and That would be even worse. No, but, but, but <laughs> I agree with you. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, we moved home to Sweden two and a half years ago. And when you move from London to Stockholm, you can, for the first time in your life, afford a, a properly sized living room. So, <laughs> because that's impossible in London. So, so, so I bought a projector TV and all that kit. Yeah. And then I come home every day and I have three kids sitting with one iPad each watching TV on the iPad. Different programs, of course. So it's playing into your world. Yeah. But, but all of that, let's move that on, because all, all of that needs to be charged for in some way. Yeah, but... Um I was thinking about the position thing, and when yeah, let's when, when Klarna was founded, um, to be honest, we uh, that was a too sophisticated question for us. So we um, we uh, we got a question from a, an online merchant, like, "Can you guys help us with payments?" And uh, Sebastian and Nicola said, "Yeah," and they tried, and then they just worked really hard. So it's not until now that we're starting to think about, okay, what's our position in this industry and. Are we really up against PayPal or the banks or payment providers or payment networks? Um, so to start with, we just tried to work harder than everyone else and build a really good product. But, but I think that's a great story, and I've, I've followed that for a long time, and it's truly true. I mean, you've executed on c customer demand rather than you know trying to invent the next iBeacon. Yeah, and... I, I and now you're trying to invest, invent the next IB company. Exactly. <laughs> right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so will that transition work? So that is a super difficult transition because we, we started focusing purely on the needs of merchants, I think, and trying to provide them with a solution that would increase sales for them um, and in return increase sales for us. But what we're finding now that since we've signed 
45,000 merchants just in Europe. If you want to continue grow 100% year on year, we have to find a new source of growth, and that has to be consumer. So the entire company has to shift in its focus from building products for merchants to building products for consumers. Mm. Um, and it's super difficult uh, because you have to change the way our engineers think, the way our product developers think, the way we think of marketing. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really difficult. I think at, at the core of what we do now is everything we, everything we develop, it, we try to put ourselves in the consumer's shoes and really think about, okay, how are they going to use this? How is this going to make their life easier? How is this going to make a transaction safer and so on? Um, and we didn't do that five years ago. Well, it, it's interesting, that transition to innovation. I'll come back to you in a second, in Daniel, but I think that's a great segue to Henrik's business because I can tell you truly that the reason that I got into this industry was actually not to work with Red Ocean companies such as you said. I have respect for business execution, but I love, love innovators. I mean, people who sit them down and think about something that nobody has done and probably not even thinking about what it can be used for too much in the very beginning. And maybe, Henrik, you really represent real IP. Can you tell us about that journey be between the three of you founders and, and why? I mean, you sat at KTH, you were like, okay, should we do like all other guys at KTH and drink beer? Or no, we're, we're going to invent eye tracking. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, <clears throat> I still remember, actually, um, John, who's one of, my, one of our co-founders and sort of the original instigator behind Toby. Uh, I knew him a little bit from before, but actually not that well. He actually worked for me as a sales guy in another company I started previously. But he gave me a call and, um, out of the blue, uh, and uh, he told me uh, about a piece of technology that he had invented. Uh, and he called it eye tracking. Uh, and this was basically him working at uh, a research institute for chemistry at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And he was doing work on using video cameras to count bubbles in liquids. And somehow he got the idea that I should be able to turn this camera around and look at an eye and determine where you're looking. And that'd be kind of cool. Uh, and uh, he spent some time in the evenings fiddling with this as, as an idea and uh, basically somehow realized that this should be able to revolutionize how mankind, all people, interact with computers. That should be possible. Um, and I remember the first time he told me about this, I, I had this little shiver down my spine and I just felt then and there that if that really works, that would be so cool. <laughs> uh, but I think at the time, we, we didn't realize or understand how difficult it is to build a company and approach something from a technology perspective. Because you're not setting yourself up for an easy ride. Uh, it, in many ways, it is the opposite way to start. It's so much easier to start from a customer, from a market, from a need, from a, from a problem. Hey, we have problems with payments, and it should be possible to fix it, and then you fix it. Uh, we truly started with the technology, and sure, there was a vision that this should be part of every computer, but, but in a way, it was also a sort of a technology in pursuit of the problem that it solves. Um, <clears throat> I do think that one of the key things that we have learned and actually has been one of the key reasons why we have succeeded so far, and it's interesting because we are actually relearning this as we speak. Um, I thought we were past that point, but it appears we're not. But the thing that we've learned is that when you do bring a technology to market, you actually have to take responsibility for also inventing the solution and finding the problem and inventing the solution to that problem using your technology. It's a very important point that nobody knows how good the wheel is until you've no, and given it's, them the whole car. 
And, and it's, I'm still surprised. I mean, today we spend a lot of time talking to some of the largest computer manufacturers on the planet, the tablet manufacturers, the, uh, the car manufacturers, etc. And you would think that these giant companies can actually invent the solution um, because we come with a very big part of the solution to them. But even they can't. Even with these large companies, even today, we have to actually take the responsibility to invent a full solution that actually solves the problem. And only then can we sell, and only then can we succeed. So it's, it's hard work. I don't know if it's a good commercial for starting tech companies, <laughs> but, but it's, it is a lot of fun. It's very exciting. I do think that the flip side of it is that once you do that, uh, and once you succeed with that, you can actually build a very strong positioning, yeah. and, and a very strong position in the market and the value chain. But, but I think that's great, and I mean, from my perspective, I think what uh, Klarna and Spotify and Magin have already succeeded in is very much this generation of liberating the consumer. And I think what we're seeing with digital kind of starting to talk to the physical world is, is the next level coming. And I think we all have to thank Mark for his substantial acquisition of Oculus because I think it opens up the eye to investors all over the world that this is a key trend to come. Wanting to shift tack a little bit and bring Daniel into the mix. I mean, one of the things that, that, that I think at the level of success you're operating in is a real day-to-day -day management issue uh, is the press. And uh, If I'm not wrong, I think Ulf from Vecan Safari is here. Ulf, hold up your hand. Yeah, now we're going to get into your territory. It's not going to be pretty. So, I mean, you guys are not having... Smooth sailing here, are you? I mean, I don't really even want to talk about Clara. It's, it's too painful. I mean, listen, people are really upset here, and they're making hens out of very, very small feathers, right? And uh, I think the whole world were impacted by Apple's acquisition of Beats, which actually, to me, really solidifies the consumer proposition of streaming, but I can tell you in the investor circles that I move, that wasn't the reaction. And the fact that last night we heard that it was worth paying $3 billion alone for the headsets, which is totally wrong, it, 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 it's maybe not helping either. And, and Henrik, you, you've executed an incredibly important and difficult acquisition. I mean, you didn't pay a lot, but... It's 200 people in the U.S., and it's a significant business. And at the same time, we have all sorts of IPO rumors in the market. That's also confusing. And, of course, you're in the bloodiest bath of all bloody baths when it comes to press. I mean, TV. I mean, the guys you compete with, sadly, they own media. So, you know, and then for you, Daniel... I mean, if we look at, maybe not Klarna, but if we look at the whole left side of me here, I mean, these guys are consumers of capital at a very decent clip. I mean, that, that's great as a banker, uh, but maybe it's not so great if mom and pop is investing in early stage startups, not realizing that they're going to get three, four, five hundred million dollars of pref shares on their top. And so, in your case, I'm concerned about the future PR that may come out of that. So what's your strategy on this? I mean, this is real. This is not easy. So, so, so first, of, first of all, I think um, all of these are companies which I think I would have wanted a small piece in. Uh, there's a ton similar ones which you think, wow, uh, why don't I own a piece of that? I'm glad that you mentioned Oculus, which Facebook bought for $2 billion. Uh, two years previously, uh, 10,000 people backed it on Kickstarter. They gave money to take the product to market. They loved it. They fall in love. They talked about it. They developed it. And then suddenly Facebook buys it. And all these fans, all these ambassadors get nothing. Of course, they knew about the conditions. But you, I would say out of 10,000 people, a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand would have said, wow, I, would, I wish I could own a part of that. And we've seen a ton of companies who could have gotten faster to the market if they had people on the ground, you know, uh, uh, people who are not only 
investors, but also ambassadors, users, clients, purchasers, etc. So um, yes, I think part of my job, which is really difficult, is to convince all of you guys and this entire business to, to stop building myths that it's complex to invest and also allowing the millions and billions to be part of stuff because I think that creates a bigger um, understanding. Right now, if you see in Sweden, we are talking about risk capital as evil, and then we're talking about the honest worker, which is like screwed by their capital. And I think if, if both parties understand more, more of each other and you have vested interests, then you break a lot of barrier, barriers. But I think at the end of the day, you want also to give the opportunity for people to say, well, you know, I'm not a wealthy VC or a wealth, wealthy business agent, but I can still get the option to invest in the potential next big thing with the risks attached, of course, because Spotify is amazing. There probably was a hundred tries from a hundred different companies who failed. In this case, timing, execution, team was brilliant. I still remember when you guys launched, it was like, wow, um, this is the next big thing. Although I still remember you were a video site from the beginning or a streaming site or something. I was like, <laughs> uh, same with Imagine. When Imagine launched and I tried for the first time, I was like, wow. But the thing is that you also want to be part of that. And I think, let, let's take this room. How many people in this room are part of Spotify? Well, maybe few, but how many people in this room would have wanted to be part of Spotify? Uh, and I think the majority. So I don't know if that replies to your question, but I think that's it's a mental state we are... Uh, I think it I doesn't, represent. but it makes you a white knight, an economic liberator, so it still makes you a good man. Now, uh, Eric, let's move to the question. So, I mean... I love your service because I don't have to stand up, fish for my wallet that's somewhere in some cupboard and then start to shout on my wife to help me find it. And sorry, I'm not a great guy. But, but so it's really convenient to press that button. But not all people agree with that. And what's the strategy? Just ignore it and grow in Germany or? Uh, well, I think most people would agree that it's simple to press the button. Um, but what we were criticized for were, was the legacy pro product that we have, where people will get a reminder fee uh, before they paid an invoice, um, or they didn't even get the invoice in the first place, um, which was uh, certainly true to a few customers, but we think, like you, that it, it was a hen of a feather, uh, although we have to take that super serious and improve the product. Um, but what was the question, basically? How, how do you deal with it? What's your strategy? We think that in the long run, um, that will serve us the best, uh, but it might open up some, uh, some difficulties like this. Um, okay. but, but in general, we just want to be as available as possible um, and use the input that we get both from media and, and dis discussions like this and when customers call us as um, good ways to improve the product. And, and Jonathan, I, I know from discussions with Martin and Daniel that you haven't really adopted that strategy. You'd be very careful with the few announcements you made. And, yeah. and when they're key, you tend to post them on your website mm. rather than tell the media about it. Um, well, I think we've also had a very um, fair crack from the media. We've had a phenomenal amount of press, a yeah. phenomenal amount of positive press. Um, you know, never be a thin-skinned entrepreneur would be my, my first tip. Um, secondly, Daniel's view. You know, I, I spoke to the press mainly because he, he just wanted to focus on the product. He felt that if he built the best product and it worked, everything else would work out. Now, in truth, um, we're gifted with so many ways of communicating with the people we want to speak to these days, whether, it's, whether it is the press or digital channels or you know, face to face, even being able to do that through Skype if, you, if you're having a meeting with key stakeholders. And I think we've had to learn, we, I think we've been good at um, not being too beguiled by the nice press that we get. Certainly when we launched in new countries, our new MD would think it's amazing because the major newspaper would ask him his view on sort of the European Commission and we had to sort of calm them down that that's not necessarily helpful. Um, but I think, we, I think you know, we, we have been available as much as we had, yeah. as we can. We've tried to explain why we don't give out the numbers and that's because we don't want to be making short-term decisions. and. Um, and increasingly what we're seeing is people do have opinions about music, particularly in the business, and there are contentious things. And when Tom York you know, says that we represent the last dying fart of a, of a music industry before 
um, before I call my mum to calm her down or um, think about what we say to the press, we see that the industry or our users self-regulate now. You know, you have someone like Avicii is the most placed artist on Spotify. He gets out and says, actually, you can do quite well on this platform. But equally, somebody like Billy Bragg, who is not a corporate shill. Um, so I think, I think you need to re respect the press. I think it's lazy to say that you don't need it. But just be aware that you don't fall into the trap of, um, of not talking to the users that you're trying to reach. Our users couldn't give a toss about whether we're going to IPO. No. or what percentage we pay. They want to know how to use our service. They want to know what they should be listening to. And we should spend the majority of our time talking to our most important stakeholder group. At our best, we do that. As I say, we, we have our moments. And I think, on the, I think that's a great segue. I mean, Henrik, uh, uh, partly engineered and I think partly just fantastic. I mean, but you had a Super Bowl moment where really your, kind of your technology was showcased at the very highest level. I mean, what was the fallout of that? Did it make a difference? <clears throat> yes. Um, so that so was... In 30 seconds, explain to those who didn't see that Super Bowl ad what it was. So basically it was the, um, this year's top rated Super Bowl ad was uh, Microsoft's ad where they showcase what Microsoft technology can do uh, for people and improving people's lives. And uh, the key part of that showcase was actually one of our users using our technology. So we got a free Super Bowl ad through Microsoft. That was pretty good, prime time. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> but I think from our perspective, um, for us, media in Sweden today is fairly insignificant, to be honest. Yeah. Um, that may change if, if things evolve, but uh, we're still at a point where we are at a very, very early phase of bringing eye tracking as a technology into the consumer mainstream. 99.9% .9 or even more than that of the human race does not know this technology yet, does not know what to use it for. Um, as your poll showed previously, none yeah. in this room has used it yet. Um, and we're at a very early stage still in getting the early adopters, and uh, in our case, it's a lot about the, the software developers to start using this technology to create amazing new user experiences. And for that, we try to definitely leverage media in general to reach out to create awareness among these early adopters, not mainstream uh, public yet, but the early adopters and find that targeted to get them to understand the technology, to get them to somehow feel what this can do and what kind of uh, amazing things they can create from it. Um, but that's a very different phase than addressing media on home turf back Correct. in Sweden, basically. Um, it's been very much not a Swedish activity from our perspective. And, and I think it's true for all of you is, uh, maybe with the exception of Funded by Me to a certain degree, and yet, but you're running very global businesses, it's global PR, and I think the takeaway, what I've learned here, and actually I'm slightly surprised by that, is that uh, you believe in having a quite open dialogue. So, so I'll, I'll monitor your activities around that. Now we're running out of time, so I'm going to move us on to the last uh, question. And, and this is, uh, I think, my uh, number one hobby horse. So based on the recent Kleiner stats, but we, we look at these data a lot as well. The 20 most valuable technology internet companies in the world are all from US and Asia in equal amount, and there isn't a single European company there. And, and I recently, two weeks ago, sat on stage in Paris with Bernard, who founded Business Objects and sadly sold it for seven bills. So he kind of just didn't get into the list. So, doesn't feel great. And, 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 you know, top of the list, we all know Apple is still there, and we know that's not going to stay. I mean, you can't run uh, a closed environment. IBM, everybody's failed on that strategy, so that's a dying story. But then we have, we have open companies like Google and Facebook and the whole Android system below that that you should all invest your money in. It'll be great longs. Uh, and, you know, 500 bill, 400 bill, 100 bill, et cetera, of valuation. At the bottom of the list, uh, uh, does any know the company number 20? Raise a hand. 
No, you're too insular. It's, it's Kiho 360 in China, $11 billion market value on $671 million of revenues. I like the rev multiple here as well. <laughs> it's obviously good to start a business in China. Now, everybody wins, right? everybody wins. you can have the crappiest service. Uh, have anybody tried Line? Uh, and now, we're not going to talk about China. We're going to talk about you. I want hand-on heart answers here. Are you going to sell the business for a measly bill or two, or actually run this on and get on the list? Starting with you, come on now. You can't have a good lifestyle on a bill. I guess not, right? No. No, the, the idea with Madian and why I start companies has not, never been to sell them. It's been to change things and make them better. So going on that path, I want to change how television is consumed. Great. And that's kind of a big market, so let's hope. And Jonathan, what was the talk in the, the management team? I, I don't know about you, but whenever I've looked into one of Daniel and Martin's four collective eyes, yeah. I've never seen anything but wanting to build you know, a, a phenomenal company that reaches billions of users. Um, I wouldn't even dare talk to them about exits. It'd be I mean, a very difficult discussion. No, would no, you? no. I, there you go. And I'm <laughs> that's a good the wrong company. discussion to have. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think you can build a company if successfully if you actually are not in it for building it as a company. You got to have that passion, and otherwise, it, you you just can't build a company with the purpose of selling it. It doesn't work. But it is interesting because probably, I bet you all of those companies on that list that are actually that big and that successful are still very founder slash entrepreneur strong, character driven. Yeah. As opposed to their competing companies that have not quite made it, that are much more board committee driven type of companies. So there is a craziness to those entrepreneurs that probably is necessary to get to that size. I think you're touching the heart of the matter, and we run a lot of stats on that, and we see that in order for a business to get into this group, it has to be founder-led, there has been zero shift of management, and the venture investors cannot have had control of the destiny. You can sell them out, sorry guys, and bring other guys in, but it has to be founder-led. Day one to 11 billion plus, and, and of course, it's going to go up. It's going to require 20 bill by the time you guys are there. Yeah. So and uh, we, uh, yeah, sorry to be boring, but we want to build the next great payments company in the world and change the way people shop online. So we'll reach that goal first and then we can sell. Maybe. And, and Daniel, by the time you get into the $11 billion club, you'll c you can put in a bid for NASDAQ and it's a fully functioning ecosystem of capital. No, surely, I think... I think uh, Adam, Adam, are you here? Yeah, well, you don't know, we were already talking, so... No. Yeah, good, good, no, good. So, no, he just didn't know it was a reverse <laughs> transaction. Yeah, no, the thing is that uh, <laughs> uh, we expect, of course, consolidation to happen. I think at the end of the day, uh, banks are interested in this model. I think a lot of people are forgetting the, the common user in the, in the uh, transaction and financial industry. And I think the ones who get the clients, the users, they will be the winners. If you, if you look at, at the list, yes, they are amazing co uh, companies, but they have amazing products with amazing clients which are loyal. And I think that's one of the hardest things. And, and, and I'm grateful to be on this panel because all of these companies here, they have really, really loyal uh, clients, of course, with a good product. So, um, you know, yes, the world is changing rapidly, and I think no, nobody who builds a company from scratch does it for the money. I think the majority does it to solve a problem or to survive or to just, you know, to feel that you matter in your in your generation or you if you, because you can. Um, in our, in our in our discussion, of course, we have 450 shareholders, so you have to plan for the future, but. Uh, uh, we would be dead by tomorrow if we if we would focus on the exit or a merge or an acquisition. Although you d we do know that the consolidation is on the map in the next three to four or five years. Well, Daniel, I think you end it in a round where I'm going to say, you run such exciting businesses, I could go on all night. But now we're all between 
us on the bar here. So I think big hand to these fantastic businesses.